In October 2010, David Morris addressed the Environmental Grantmakers Association Annual Conference in Pacific Grove, California on the important issue of preemption. The talk may be even more relevant today, a time when red states are increasingly preempting the authority of communities to develop solutions to pressing economic and social problems. Also offering comments on the issue are Martin Chavez, Executive Director of ICLEI, and Terry Taminen, Executive Director of Seventh Generation. Preemption is the, is the uh, issue of the day at this panel. Uh, and by preemption, uh, we mean when a higher level of government or a court, a regulatory commission, uh, undermines or eliminates the ability of lower levels of government and communities to address problems creatively. And the question might be, so why does it matter? And in my mind, it matters uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the obvious, it inhibits creativity. Uh, what we find is that uh, most of the progressive uh, pieces of uh, policy started at the bottom up in American history. So minimum wage uh, was first state-based. Uh, unemployment insurance uh, was first uh, state-based. Maximum hour was actually locally uh, based. Um, California was the uh, first uh, to have a Clean Air Act, to have uh, a uh, anti-pollution or reduction in pollution standard uh, by the Los Angeles area uh, in, the, uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and uh, states uh, tried to defend the uh, usury uh, issue in terms of predatory lending uh, and the like. Um, so what you find is that there are states and localities that have adopted policies, and those policies eventually became national policies. Um, but when they became national, when, but when what happens often is that as a number of states begin to adopt policies with often those who they are offending, uh, fighting every inch of the way, uh, when enough states uh, embrace a policy, then those who they are offending go to Washington and say, why don't we have a national policy and let it be the lowest common denominator and let it preempt uh, mm -hmm. what's going on at the state levels. And so that dynamic occurs again and again. Um, states, I mentioned, had usury laws, which essentially means it, uh, it maximized the amount of interest that you could charge on your credit cards or on your, uh, uh, on your predatory uh, lending. And in 1998, Congress, preempted any further state laws. But in 2004, an agency of the government uh, said that all existing laws uh, could only apply to national uh, to state banks, not to national banks. And so it put states in the position whereby they could, in fact, have interest caps, but only for state chartered banks, which meant they wouldn't be competitive, and therefore they actually abolished uh, that. So it inhibits our abilities. Uh, to uh, be uh, creative. The second thing that it does is it inhibits our ability to widen constituencies by marrying economic objectives and environmental objectives. I think it's, as we find out in 2010 in the United States, it's extremely important for us to say we need to protect the environment because, we need to reduce carbon uh, emissions because, uh, but what we find is that when states do that, when they try to favor their own, if you will, uh, through their environmental standards, that they run into uh, preemption uh, issues. Uh, for example, Massachusetts uh, enacted a uh, renewable portfolio standard where they required the uh, renewable energy to be generated in state. Uh, and uh, they were essentially uh, charged uh, by a Canadian company with violating the North American Free Trade Agreement. And last week, they, uh, they upended uh, their own uh, regulation on that uh, issue. Uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, has essentially said, but the courts have denied, has said that it has the right to overturn any state that rejects a high voltage transmission line. Uh, and there are governors from Maine to Virginia that wrote a letter uh, to FERC and said, uh, no, no, you, you shouldn't do that because if you do that, uh, you're doing it uh, justified because the winds blow uh, more uh, aggressively in uh, North Dakota and therefore they can generate electricity more cheaply. But we think we can elect generate electricity internal to ourselves and off the coasts and we don't want to have to pay for a long uh, transmission line that undermines our ability 
uh, to be uh, self-reliant. Uh, sometimes the issue, uh, the issue, what, what happens in terms of preemption uh, is that it undermines the ability of states to operate effectively in terms of decision making. I'll give you an example. The state of Michigan, this is the late 1980s, uh, enacted a, a wonderful statute which said every county in Michigan has to be responsible for its own solid wastes. And to be responsible, it had to have a landfill with the capacity to handle 20 years worth of its solid waste. And in return for accepting the responsibility to handle its own solid waste, it would have the authority to say no to someone else's waste. And so it could reject the importation of garbage from other counties in Michigan and other places outside of Michigan. And the Supreme Court said, well, okay for counties inside of Michigan, but not outside of Michigan. And so it essentially said, you can accept the obligation, uh, but you cannot have the authority to deny the, the, uh, uh, the dumping of garbage into your landfills. Well, the problem with that is that if you have a 20-year capacity in your landfill, you want to make that capacity last as long as possible, which means you're going to maximize recycling. This was an essentially a pro-recycling and pro-use ordinance. But if you maximize recycling, it just simply means that someone else is going to come in and dump garbage in your landfill and the capacity will be uh, exhausted. Uh, and so those laws uh, were under uh, mine. Uh, sometimes in terms of preemption, it's not outright preemption, but you have to ask permission. And you sort of have to have a little thing that says, can I go to the bathroom? Uh, and, uh, and that is uh, quite often the case. Uh, organic standards, for example, states can develop their own organic standards for certification, but they have to ask permission of the USDA and it has to approve them. Uh, as Terry knows and, and, might, uh, and might mention today, uh, California uh, <coughs> asked permission uh, to, uh, to have a waiver so that it didn't have to put ethanol uh, into its gas tanks. It said, we will, we will achieve the performance standards, we will achieve the same goals, uh, but we don't uh, want to have to have ethanol, and that waiver was rejected by uh, first uh, President Clinton and then uh, President uh, Bush. Now, in the environmental movement, often, but not always, we had standards that preempted but said that what we're doing, what we mean the federal government is doing, is establishing a floor and not a ceiling. So it essentially said, you can do no worse, but you could do a lot better if you want to. The Clean Air Act, for example, the Clean Water Act, uh, all allowed uh, states to, uh, to uh, do uh, better. In the climate change legislation at the federal level, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which didn't pass but was in there, uh, allowed states to have a higher renewable portfolio standard. But the carbon cap preempted state and regional greenhouse gas accords. Uh, and so um, there are different ways in which it handled things. Back in the 1970s, the federal government uh, preempted states from raising their efficiency standards for vehicles. And California consistently has gotten, has bumped up against that when it said in the 1990s, well, we want to have a mandate for electric vehicles. And the car company said, well, that sounds an awful like an efficiency standard. Uh, and, and, uh, and California essentially backed up from that electric vehicle mandate because they thought they would lose uh, in the courts. And most recently, the issue was greenhouse gas emission, tailpipe emissions. Well, is that an efficiency standard? And they had to go through uh, several years, court battles, EPA uh, battles, and the like, to finally get the uh, ability and the authority uh, to control tailpipe uh, emission standards. Uh, one more issue related to preemption uh, is that on a, on a regulatory basis, this is less a legislative basis, uh, there's an issue as to whether you are going to have a standard which is a performance standard or a prescriptive standard. Now in the case of preemption that I've been talking about so far, you're preempting a community from making the rules that can allow it to creatively address, uh, address problems. In the case of performance versus prescriptive standards, you are preempting the right of businesses and individuals to be creative. For example, Building codes, until maybe 25 years ago, were prescriptive standards. They said you had to have this amount of insulation in the walls, this amount of insulation in the ceilings, and so forth. That was called prescriptive. We are prescribing what you are to do. And then they changed them to a performance standard, which said you are not allowed to have more than an X amount of heat loss uh, over a year, uh, or you are not allowed to have more than X amount of energy use per capita uh, over the year. 
Uh, and so that was a performance standard, and you could meet that any way that you want, and it unleashed an enormous amount of creativity on uh, the part of architects, passive solar, uh, and so forth, uh, being uh, just uh, just one of those. Uh, in, in, we've heard about the um, cap and trade, and often we hear uh, we hear people who are advocates of, of, uh, of cap and trade point to the 1990 Clear Act, Clean Air Act amendments that uh, dealt with uh, SOX and NOX uh, reductions. And essentially what it did is it established a cap and then it reduced that cap. Uh, and the argument, and it allowed trading. And a number of people say that because it allowed trading, it was able to do that more quickly and more cheaply. Well, no. What happened was, a uh, little known fact, is that the EPA changed its standard to comply with the Clean Air Act from a prescriptive standard to a performance standard. Previously to 1990, you had to put in a coal scrubber if you're going to reduce your, your, your SOX and the like. Hmm? Post-1990, you could do anything you want as long as you achieve that performance standard. And the cheapest way to do that was to buy low sulfur coal. Uh, and so utilities bought low sulfur coal. We could talk about what that means in terms of more carbon dioxide going up and being emitted. But nevertheless, it, it bought low sulfur coal, uh, and therefore it reduced its costs uh, tremendously. So what we are here to do uh, this morning this afternoon, I guess, uh, is to talk about preemption in its various facets and to talk about what it means from an environmental perspective and what it means if you are going to be working with a city or working with a state uh, and working with, uh, with the business community uh, in terms of it. Now, there will be two speakers uh, after me, and the first one uh, will be Martin Chavez, uh, who was born and raised in Albuquerque. So uh, that region of the country is represented. And he was a uh, mayor for 12 years in Albuquerque. He was a mayor for one term, then he sat out the next term, and then he was a mayor for two more terms. Uh, he was the first, uh, first mayor who was re-elected to two consecutive terms uh, since they had changed to a strong mayor uh, form of government. And Martin is known uh, throughout the world, actually, in terms of the green initiatives that he embraced while he was Mayor, he was Energy Innovator of the Year, uh, according to the American Engineers Association. Uh, he was the 2008 World Leadership Award. He earned that uh, in London for his work on water and utilities. Uh, Albuquerque was the best large city addressing climate change, in large part because of Marty's uh, work there uh, in 2008, according to the U.S. Conference uh, of Mayors. And so Marty knows what uh, what uh, knows how to tackle problems and the obstacles in the way of tackling problems are from the bottom up. He is now the, uh, the head of the ICLE uh, US uh, branch in terms of sustainability. So he works with cities and has worked with cities all over the world. Let's open it up to questions, comments, additions, subtractions. <clears throat> Clarifying question, that um, sure. the a right of states to opt in to California standards, does that just apply to clean air or EPA, or does it apply to all California regulatory decisions? Yes, it's all regulatory decisions, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> No, no, it's just the clean air. <laughs> I, I actually have another question, which is, are there cases where preemption is appropriate, for example, with Arizona's immigration law or the efforts to create some kind of national school equity standards? Um, are there cases where it's not, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to think of the Arizona immigration case as to whether that's a ceiling or a floor or whether <coughs> it's, you know, prescriptive or performative. I, I'm not sure how to categorize that, but I think we're all relieved to see it preempted. Oh, you wouldn't have uh, the, the, the remarkable benefits of the Clean Water Act, Clean, Clean Air Act, or the Civil Rights Act. You didn't have federal preemption, so right. it's, it's not always bad. So what are the... I think that, that um, the immigration issue is, is interesting and there's someone here who wants to, wants to you know, comment on that. Um, and I, we're, we're, I'm, I work with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, so you get a sense of what I think, which is, which is that the, the issue of subsidiarity, which is a concept that the Catholic Church invented, um, uh, which, which is essentially that things should be settled on the on the level most appropriate to them, and the lowest level is most appropriate, unless and the burden of proof is on you to say it should be above that. Having said that, <coughs> my feeling is that, that the federal government can intervene and should intervene, as well as the Supreme Court, when it's a Bill of Rights issue. 
So when you're talking about a majority oppressing a minority, which sort of by definition can be done through a democratic process, mm -hmm. you need to have some, some mechanism that can come in there and say, you are not allowed to do that. Um, but in, in non-Bill of Rights cases, it gets to be much trickier uh, as to whether you would or you wouldn't. And, 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 I would, and I would, my default would be say that you shouldn't. Now, in the case of immigration, it cuts across both of those, right? So it's a Bill of Rights issue as they're humans, but they're also here illegally. And so mm -hmm. what, what right does an illegal person have to be here and who should enforce that? So that, that gets to be very tricky, and, um, and one can say that states and cities, especially in the south, southwestern United States, have intervened, and Marty might want to speak to this, but uh, they've intervened you know, in part because of hostility, but I think in larger part because of exasperation, uh, and you know, because the federal government hasn't stepped in. Uh, at least they felt that they haven't stepped in and done something. And so you do have that, you know, that problem, but I'd be interested to know what what, uh, what you think in terms of preemption and, and the issue of, uh, of, of, of immigration? You see, I, I thought you were asking me as a New Mexican, we might, let's go down to Arizona because it drives tourism. <laughs> 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 strategy, all of us are trying to figure out how to make progress, and so we've all seen the failures, <laughs> and clearly right now in the current context, there's a regrouping around how do we accelerate change, positive change, at the municipal and state level. And so one fight against preemption is simply to accelerate that work, and in the doing of it, building so much political will that if preemption is threatened, it's much harder for them to pull it off because you've built buy-in. And we've got three champions sitting up here on that strategy. And I just wonder if, you know, I'd love to know from each of you, you know, what is the most forward uh, acceleration of the work that you're seeing? You know, if you could each speak for just a minute or two. Mark, you said, okay, so we're just going back to our original strategy. We're going to, so, you know, tell us what is, what's the edge that you're, you know, how far are you taking in terms of efficiency and renewable deployment at the municipal level? And Terry, you know, the efficiency work at the state level, are you, are you accelerating it? And do you see that as a key part of fighting against the, the threat of preemption? 
Maybe well, that question is too big and sweeping. Well, not necessarily. <coughs> uh, when we work with member city or county, we take them through a five-step process, a five milestone process. Assess your, your your baseline. What what are your emissions? Uh, what are your goals? What's your strategy for getting there? We work with implementation software, uh, consulting, and then help them monitor. And essentially, what we we train them in is a process uh, that is is ongoing, uh, and we find that to be transformational. We don't select technologies for them. We give them an array of best practices and possibilities. And so uh, if, if that particular uh, community wants to focus on energy, uh, that's their choice. If they're doing it because they believe that climate change is real, that's fine. And, and I'm sure Terry will testify this through uh, Center for Climate Strategies. Is once you take people from different backgrounds through a process, it's very transparent, very democratic, very open. Uh, you find out that they agree on 95% of everything that's put in front of them. And you just either get over the 5% or ignore the 5%, you've made substantial progress. I think what I would add to that is was inherent in your, in your question and your comment there, which is that you know the deeper you can drive the stake in the ground, the harder it is to root it out later, right. and, and the more stakes, whatever the right analogy is here, and maybe this is having you know worked for Arnold for a while is that yeah bigger must be better, um, and and but it is I mean so for example in the middle of November here coming up uh, we're going to be helping quite a few of these subnational governments launch something called the R20 the regions of government uh, regions of climate action, and these are subnational governments some large cities as well as uh, mostly states and provinces that with the help of the UN, this is not saying, oh, UN, you failed and, you know, screw you. This is with their help and, in fact, their encouragement and some funding from them <coughs> to do this bottom-up approach. But now to say, all right, so what is it that you states and some provinces in Canada and some places in Brazil and so forth have figured out that uh, if aggregated together would start to look like the global deal that's eluded us mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a Kyoto successor? And at what point do you get to a tipping point where that deeply rooted stake and broadly distributed stakes uh, begins to show that, gee, you've got 25, 30, 40, 50 percent of the economy doing these things. It can't, therefore, be that hard to get national governments that have been reluctant or international <laughs> institutions to then come to agreement. So, uh, so this is now a very deliberate strategy. Um, and, uh, and the successes, I think, from the states and the subnationals and the cities uh, to formalize this, it, this is their their desire, and the recognition I think finally may not be in Congress so much, but but by the UN, that uh, this is where the progress is likely to be for the next couple of years. So we better harness it and uh, try to drive that forward. And, and I would say just a couple of uh, a couple of, uh, of examples. One is the PACE program, uh, and and I think that. You know, essentially, what the, the program, as Marty said, but I, I just think it needs to be said again, cities uh, often assess, it's called an assessment, they assess on your taxes for street lights, they assess for sidewalks, they assess for, so, I mean, it's, it's common and it's considered <laughs> allowed and it's a public uh, purpose. Uh, and what the Federal Finance Agency said was that energy efficiency in solar is not a public purpose. Uh, now, the, the uh, the head of that agency uh, is the acting interim head of that agency. He serves at the pleasure of the president. Uh, and so um, from everything I know, the president of the United States can sit him down and say, Would you, do you like your job uh, or not? Um, and and uh, you know, that's a, a program uh, which started with one city and then became five cities uh, and was just about to explode uh, to possibly up to 100 cities. Uh, and a program that was probably a half a billion dollar program on its way to being a multi-billion dollar program. Uh, and so, you know, that had the real possibility and still uh, has the real possibility of unleashing a fascinating dynamic, in part because the city is, is creating an efficiency bank, uh, but in part because the city is, is creating an, a, a sustainability agency. Um, what happens right now in terms of cities is that they have in the mayor's office or in the planning office or somewhere a little group that's the sustainability planning group. Uh, and they do their, they do their planning. Uh, and they sometimes connect with other agencies in some kind of vague process and they do public education. And that's all well and good. But in this case, when you have a bank 
A bag connects to everyone, and it connects in a very real way. It connects to the contractors. It connects backward to the permitting process. It connects to the incentive program. <coughs> so it becomes a one-stop shopping that eventually we hoped uh, and expected that it would in fact become uh, the municipal agency for sustainability. So I think that that's a, a, a fascinating bottom-up uh, movement. Um, there are uh, now in states a number of different dynamics <coughs> that are occurring around renewables where, where scale issues are taken into account. Uh, and I think that's fascinating because it doesn't appear that that's going to be preempted uh, under the Interstate Commerce Clause of the way it has to be in state. Uh, I mean, if you could say it has to be rooftop solar, but it could be rooftop solar out of state too, what does that mean? Right? So that would be a meaningless kind of thing, but you could open it up. You say, well, you got a rooftop in Arizona, you can get your electricity to California, you would be counted too. Right? Well, you can't actually get your electricity beyond your neighborhood. Uh, so you know, that would be something where, where uh, and California is just about to uh, issue a, a, an option for solar. Uh, I think it's going to be one gigawatt of solar for uh, zero to 20 megawatts. Um, so that will be an interesting uh, sort of you know, breakthrough um, for it. Uh, and then the other is, in terms of building codes, uh, what, what Marty said is, is true and it's interesting in terms of the, um, in terms of the, um, um, in terms of the, uh, the air conditioning and heating systems. Um, it'd be interesting if you had a carbon neutral building code, which is a performance code, whether it would still have that same problem associated with it. In other words, you say, you can meet it anyway, and yes, if you upgrade your appliance, that's one way for you to do it. Um, but if you don't do that, you would do it another way. Uh, and, in, um, and in Europe, they are now, uh, England is now uh, introducing uh, uh, zero uh, energy over a year, zero net energy, uh, building uh, codes and mandates. Uh, and on the continent, uh, there's a couple of places that are beginning to introduce positive uh, building. You have to have a net positive energy generation uh, over a year. So those are, I think, programs that don't lend themselves to preemption and do lend themselves to proliferation on a lot of our basis. You had uh, someone over here? Oh, yes. Uh, so, um, yes, thank you, David. I just wanted to um, ask Terry if you would uh, just say a little bit more about the subnational, what you said, we, first of all, that's our show for me, is um, uh, helping them on climate change. Mm -hmm. Well, the WE is my, my consulting group of uh, uh, seven generation advisors, and you know we continue to work with Schwarzenegger and a lot of these other governors and subnational leaders in Canada and around the world. Uh, and so we're acting as a secretariat to just help them organize to actually incorporate a nonprofit called the R20. It's uh, with the help of the UN. We'll be based in Geneva, but we're creating an R20 USA nonprofit as well, um, so that. Many of you might be grant makers and might be inclined to fund the startup and the, the work of that sort of thing and finding the projects that will uh, stimulate the low carbon economy and, and for these states and regions to meet their goals. The idea will be very much like uh, what the UNFCCC is doing at the national level, which is the states uh, and, and provinces and, and cities will set uh, their greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, they'll develop plans that uh, help them identify how they're going to meet those targets and then with the help of the World Bank and uh, several other institutions we're creating a green investment fund that will help those jurisdictions uh, access the capital and perhaps grants or other incentives that they need to, to uh, operationalize those plans and then lots of measuring and reporting. So again, the whole goal is to show that if we can do it at a subnational level in a very tangible way Marty's point, what a lot of these states have done, uh, it's not just dusty plans that sit on a shelf. It's, uh, it's something that uh, has very deep stakeholder buy-in uh, from the beginning, you know, just because of the hard work of, of actually going in, figuring out what works, what's credible uh, and scientific, and then demonstrating it and being honest about what doesn't work, uh, and then measuring as you go along. Thank you. Other uh, comments or, or questions? Um, I, I, something I, I didn't say uh, in the talk, which is on a positive note, um, I had mentioned the Interstate Commerce Clause and how that, and free trade, by the way, is the Interstate Commerce Clause writ large. Um, but when cities uh, began saying no to Walmart uh, and counties, they went to court. Uh, Walmart went to court and said, you're interfering with Interstate Commerce, you can't do that. And the court said in that case, consistently, 
Mm, yeah, it does inhibit interstate commerce, but, but cities traditionally have the right of, of land use planning. Uh, and this comes under land use planning, and it comes under their police power. Uh, and so it's been pretty consistent, <coughs> actually almost universally consistent, that they're allowed to do it. And they're allowed to do it in a very rigorous, quite aggressive um, way. And so I think that that's been, um, mm -hmm. that's been useful to know that there are, you know, that, that, that cities, although not mentioned by the Constitution, that if they're, meaning that they're creatures of the state, uh, they are also uh, an entity of government that is the sort of first line of defense and recognized by the court in terms of ensuring public safety and the public welfare in a physical sense. Uh, and so they are allowed uh, certainly uh, preference uh, on, on certain other policies. I just mentioned one other thing that, that is happening since Betsy uh, asked, and some might not think it's climate related, but there are now 60 cities uh, and growing uh, <clears throat> that have built their own fiber networks that they own. Uh, and you know, this is an issue, and, and we've been working on this issue um, for, for a number of years, and, and, uh, and interestingly enough, most of these cities are conservative Republican cities building up a, a socialist a communication system. <laughs> they don't call it that, but you know, nevertheless, um, what's interesting about that is that uh, most cities have lousy service, and the way they deal with it is to beg to go to the state to go to the Public Utility Commission, uh, and most of our brethren go to the Federal Communications Commission and say we need net neutrality, we need digital divide overcome, we need you know, all of these things, all of which is worthwhile because that's their role, that's the Federal Communications Commission's role. But if you build the system yourself, you set the rules of the road. Uh, and then therefore, uh, you get to lobby your city council, and often these things, the rules of the road, actually are really quite terrific. Uh, and so, you know, these are things that, that you know, three or four years ago, there were maybe five cities that did it, and they were very tiny cities. Um, more recently, Lafayette, Louisiana did it, uh, and more recently than that, Chattanooga did it. Uh, and so when Google announced that it was looking for a city that it was going to install a, a system that could reach one gigabyte, uh, uh, and, um, and it would pay for the system, and you had I can't remember somebody from Florida, a mayor jumping into shark infested waters or whatever, the mayor of Duluth jumped into you know, Lake Superior at the wrong time of the year uh, in order to explain that they wanted this. Well, Chattanooga announced that uh, actually the next week after Google had made their announcement, uh, it was unveiling its one gigabyte system. Uh, so it actually didn't need Google to build the system, it had already built it. Um, but once you have a telecommunications network, then in terms of telecommunications, reducing physical travel, and in terms of smart grid, Chattanooga is doing extremely interesting things in, in smart grid, whereas a lot of investor-owned utilities either don't like it. Uh, in the case of Excel in Boulder, Colorado, it was a 400% uh, percent increase over, over budget, and they finally have withdrawn from the whole thing. Uh, but in the case of Chattanooga, they're doing it right. So once you have a system that connects every building uh, in a very high-speed, literally unlimited capacity way, then you can do environmental things that you couldn't do otherwise if you had to beg the investor-owned utility or if you had to beg the uh, Comcast or Verizon. You know, David, can I ask Marty a question? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious about obviously what Albuquerque has done and you know, Greenest City and the various awards that you got. You know, we've talked about preemption from a variety of different levels, not the least of which is the voters. And I'm assuming that as a city council, as a mayor, you had to have some buy-in from voters lest they oust the people that were making these kinds of decisions and kind of the ultimate preemption, if you will, uh, or California style, pass their own measures that, uh, that reversed course. How do you engage, and I wonder if we could open this up to other people for good examples of getting the public to come along with you at the same pace? Because I really think, you know, you talked about uh, expressions of frustration over, over immigration, for example, and that's really what it was. And I think Prop 23 here in California is to some degree the same thing. I mean, yes, it's some out-of-state oil companies that are worried about their profits, but <coughs> just like with the example I gave before about the auto companies, we just didn't bring them along at the right pace. I'm not sure these couple of Texas oil companies could ever have been brought along short of running out of oil. But, uh, but I think these do exemplify the fact that you've got to bring constituents along or somebody is going to find a way to preempt you. I mean, that, this topic required. Mm -hmm. So how did you overcome that or bring along your citizens at the same pace to avoid that? And I'm just wondering if others might comment on what they've seen either directly or from their, their grantees. 
Well, when we were when I was in talking my city council, I brought Terry in, actually. Uh, and uh, the help of two votes, actually. Uh, 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 I think leaders should always be in front of the crowd. Um, but you won't be so far out in front that they can't see it or, or hear you. And so it's always a, it's, it's a constant process of engagement. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I believe for a long time that if you believe that climate change is real and your issue is climate change, you ought to talk realistically and seriously about the science of climate change. It's, it's a real thing, because it is. Uh, but different communities have different perspectives. And so uh, for Albuquerque, we were really looking at the green economy uh, and particularly well situated for solar uh, and wind. Uh, and so let's talk about jobs. Uh, we, had a, uh, we have a military base. Let's talk about national security. Uh, as Stephen Pickens says, I think something like 60, 70, 40 percent of, of all of the oil we import comes from nations that the State Department says don't go there. It's a bad place to be if, if you're a U.S. citizen. So whatever would appeal to the different markets, as long as it was intellectually honest, we did that. A lot of neighborhood meetings, just on and on, the seniors and the different constituencies. And that's one of the reasons I think that the local elected officials are particularly important because they are so intimate uh, in their relationships uh, with, with, with their constituents. People know what you're getting at the, at the grocery store. And they go home and they tell uh, their spouse or friends, yeah, there's boxes at the grocery store, their box, whatever it may be. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's an important relationship that only local government can do. And maybe two or three governors, given the size of the states. <coughs> so even follow up to that question: We're, How did the uh, the local uh, development community uh, react to uh, your building code changes? What, 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 did you bring them along, or uh, we did? We did eight months uh, worth of meetings uh, with the business community at the table. The chamber, the economic development folks, all the usual suspects, uh, and then the principal, the largest business uh, people. The best ones get it. Uh, they, 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 if you're a developer and, and uh, you can build the old sprawl development and, and make the fast dollar, but the good ones know that if you make your community walkable uh, and a place that people want to be, you can sell it for more, frankly. So we really engage them. And it's what I alluded to earlier, and that is. If you get people of goodwill, no matter what their background, in the same room that you spend time, you start with that premise that they're all people of goodwill and want good things for the community, you end up agreeing on most things. You really do. If it gets reduced to you know, one sentence or bumper sticker uh, type of dialogue, <coughs> lost them. They've got their bumper One of the nice things, things about working on the local level yeah. is that the people that Marty will be talking to are, in fact, the developers or the builders, or the contractors. Or, I mean, whereas when you get to the state level, you tend to talk to the lobbyists. And if you get to the federal level, you only talk to the lobbyists. And so if you're talking about somebody who represents an industry, it, it's almost impossible, it seems to me, unless you have leverage over the entire industry, you could say, let's sit down and do some hard bargaining. But the local level, it's not always the case, but in most cases, you are talking to the person who will be immediately affected. Uh, and, and the person who knows what they're going through. Uh, and that person is persuadable just because you're talking about it within their context, as opposed to somebody who's hired to stop something from happening. That's what their job is, uh, not to talk to you about how to enable something, but how to disable something. I, I just interject. I had this conversation this morning before breakfast with somebody, and, and they basically expressed everything on climate change from a, a partisan perspective. Well, the Republicans are killing everything, the Democrats are for everything, and I think it's much, it's much more centered around whose ox is getting gored. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's what industry is going to be most impacted? It's a special interest. And I never get it with these Tea Party folks. Why we don't appeal to them on that basis? Right. You know, do you really want big oil controlling everything? That's what's going on. They are vested interests uh, who uh, resist change because they're not in their best economic uh, interests. That's which is that, which, you know, I mean, it comes to the communication issue, and, and I'd just be interested in the show of hands on this, because we were having this debate in New York last week with some funders. I don't know if anyone was at that meeting that was hosted by Rockefeller Foundation, but uh, where uh, Paul Morris got up and spoke very passionately about the need to just not run away from the fact that it is climate change. You know, we all are afraid to use those words because we're afraid to alienate the people that might not agree with us, and so we, we talk about 
security or economic advantage or efficiency or other things, and we're careful not to say the words climate change anymore. But he was arguing that you know that happened during the during the civil uh, the, the, the civil rights debate, where people were afraid to say that it became polarizing, and so they started just talking about moving members of, uh, of society into the middle class and economic development and the various other buzzwords instead of civil rights and, and that he thought that was a mistake and he said it much better than I'm saying it if, if any of you were there you, you know or you can ask Paul. But so I'm just curious here, how many people today on the climate change issue, if you, if you had only one choice, if you had to go out now and, and fund a campaign or work on a campaign uh, to, try to, to, to try to get comprehensive legislation or, or so solutions to the climate change challenge in the United States, how many of you would advocate for saying the words climate change? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. So about half, and I'm assuming the other half would prefer other... other <coughs> I would want to do some research about how my audience heard those words before I made that decision. I mean, in other words, I don't think it's a right or wrong decision. I think it's, it's I'd like to just respond to that because I, I think that that is actually what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And so the White House actually had a communications meeting at early in the first term when they brought in all the environmental community. And I was there and they said, these are the talking points. And they said, do not mention climate change. Mm -hmm. Only talk about green energy jobs, clean energy economy, and energy independence. And Bill McKibben stood up and said, um, that might come back to taunt us. Um, because we have to change the terms of the debate, not just meet people where they're at. We need to change the conversation so people have, but then we've got climate gate. And, uh, you know, in fact, the other side started talking about climate change and we weren't talking about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I do feel that there is a tendency on our mm -hmm. side to do, to follow the polls too much and not to try to change the terms of the debate. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't need to do that research and figure out how does that how does that language resonate. Maybe it's been too polluted now, but you have to basically ultimately take the, tell the truth on some level. You know, we we, we overthink it I think, a little bit sometimes. Well, maybe that's another advantage of working at the local level is that you tend to understand your audience. You know what they're you mean. You know who you're talking to. You know how they hear you. You know what words push their buttons or don't push their. I mean, you can communicate with them. Yeah. Although, well, let me, although let me, who, who are you? Who do you want to reach at your local level? I mean, is it is it that we have to bend over backwards to reach those tea partiers because they've got the loudest megaphone at the moment, or in our communities do we empower and enable our friends and then you know try to get sort of some independent voters or independent minds? I mean, again, where we, we may fully understand how the different parts of our community are hearing things, but which one do we then spend our time and effort? working on persuading to get to a majority is a question. If, if I could, I suppose it's a little devil's advocate, but um, I'm one of those people who wouldn't have raised my hand. Uh, and, and my question is, uh, what, what do you want to do on behalf of climate change? I mean, obviously you want to reduce carbon emissions, right? But how would you go about doing that? Now you've persuaded everybody and you have a car. So what is it that you do? Well. You would improve your building standards tremendously. You would improve your vehicle efficiency standards tremendously. You would increase your renewable portfolio standard, you know, tremendously, and so forth. All of which we're doing. So the question then becomes: Well, are we saying that when we want to when we want to increase the renewable portfolio standard, we would be able to do it? We would be able to ask for 100 percent if we were doing climate change, whereas we're only asking for 30 percent if we're doing it for another purpose, or if we're doing vehicle efficiency standards. You know, the vehicle efficiency standards were not improved by Obama; they were improved by Congress before Obama, or at least you know they, they required them to be improved. Uh, and it wasn't a climate change issue. Are we saying that if it was a climate change issue, it, it would it, we would be able to persuade people to go much further, much faster? I mean, I'm trying to get a handle. What what happens if you persuade people about climate change and a carbon emission is that you get you get a cap, you get a methodology, you get a a a, 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 a quantitative assessment. You get to see whether you were better last year than you were this year. All of which is fascinating. <clears throat> but in terms of the actual policies to reduce the carbon emissions, what is it that using the term climate change? gets us, and Bill McKibble would say, it gets us a sense that 
is a sense of urgency that you don't have otherwise. That you won't have in terms of terrorism and oil, which I disagree with him about. But nevertheless, he would say that you have a sense of urgency, which would translate presumably into meaning that you should, you would double the efficiency of your vehicles within five years, rather than improve them by 50%. Or that you would get 75% renewables or 75% wind. So, but no one is talking about 75% wind. They're talking about 30% wind by 2030. They're talking about increasing the vehicle standards more than they've been increased, but certainly not to the level that you would need them if you were talking about climate change. So what is it in terms of policies uh, that, that one would get by talking about climate change as opposed to using these other terms that we were talking about? Peggy? Um, I don't know whether... Um I don't know whether it works, or maybe that maybe my understanding may be 32, for instance. But it is um, it is the most integrated approach that California's had, and because of greenhouse gases, right? Because of climate change, so that it requires you to talk about you know transportation, land use, and health. You know, it's, it has all those components. So it so policy wise, it's beginning to talk about it in a way that forces integration mm -hmm. or comprehension. Mm -hmm. Of a number of issues, and then they're tied, then they're connected, and it's harder to get the lobbyists to come in and pull them right. apart. Mm -hmm. and you, and right down to the point where the lobbyists are good, you know, um, salesmen. They come in and they have their thing, and if it's, you're talking about their thing, then they can they can shoot it down. If you've got them all in the room and you're talking about this and this and this and this and this, you can't send the same person in that room. It's suddenly somebody who has to collaborate instead of. Um, attack one thing. So it seems to me climate change, for all its negative and positive things, I mean, people think that, you know, it's, it's too intellectual or it's too whatever it is. If you use the language around that, that allows you to integrate. That's the value of it for policy. And, and it creates a zero sum game. And I, I recall I was a week on the job at the California EPA, and uh, Kit Bond of Missouri, the senator, uh, tried to attach a rider to a spending bill that would have preempted California's right to regulate small, highly polluting two-stroke engines. And uh, one of my best allies in that fight turned out to be the American Petroleum Institute. Because when I went to them and I said, look, if he succeeds, and we and then other states cannot regulate this particularly unregulated and very dirty source of emissions, but we still have to get to the same goal, we're going to come after your refiners and you guys even harder. And they suddenly went to Capitol Hill with us and lobbied against Kim <laughs> That was only because we had that broader metric, you know, the thing he was talking about, that we had that broader framework against which to measure each of these things. So to your point, David, it's not just, well, would we double uh, fuel efficiency standards, for example? Well, maybe, but maybe it would be more cost effective to do something else as long as we're getting to that bigger goal. But if we don't have a bigger goal, then we don't know. Good answers. Other comments? Well, again, I think it's important to remember, Terry didn't ask, would you just talk about climate change? He asked, would you mention it? Ah. And so I, I think that what Peggy's point is, is we need to figure out how to tell the story of, of, of really what the threat is and what the promise is. And the many things that are going to be solved if we pivot to a different kind of a new energy economy, rather than only telling part of the story and uh, change the terms of the debate. So we have, I think what you get from that is not a specific policy solution. You get the political support, the, the actual public understanding, as Peggy pointed out, where it's much more difficult to manipulate or come in with a, with a, false, with a false set of solutions. I was uh, at a conference in Sweden that I was speaking at. The Prime Minister opened a conference. Uh, and it, was, it was a conference on, on energy. And, he, he uh, talked about climate change, and he said, said to the audience, well, we know that, that, the, that the climate change and global warming was a term that he used, but it's going to affect equatorial and, and poorer countries in the southern hemisphere um, first and worst, uh, and that Sweden and northern European countries will be affected, uh, but it will be more modest and it will be longer term. He said, but that shouldn't stop us from doing what's morally right. Uh, and that morally we should, and, you can't, and I turned to the person next to me and I said, oh, I've never heard the term mor morality as, as, as applied to climate change by any American politician. They just say, oh my God, I've been talking about morality. Uh, but he was, you know, he, he was saying, look, and we're doing, it, we're doing it for us in the long term, but we're doing it for them uh, in the short term, and that's okay to say.
Mm -hmm. I'd be interested, um, Sarah Bell, uh, given the success of the feed-in tariff in Germany, mm -hmm. um, places like Italy now, um, what your thoughts are on feed-in tariffs in the U.S. at the local level? Um, there's certainly lots of issues of preemption there, um, but at, with the municipal utilities that do have the power to enact feed-in tariffs, just be interested in the panel's thoughts. What well, tax increases? <laughs> Well, feed, we need feed in tariffs, yeah, yeah, yeah. tariffs yeah. I, I think are extremely, extremely useful. Uh, and and uh, we've been promoting them in, in the states and cities for quite some time. Uh, there are many different kinds of feed and tariffs. Uh, and so it gets a little tricky. California has a feed and tariff that a number of people are not so happy with. Ontario has a feed and tariff that requires that 50% of the value uh, of the generation. Uh, it all has to be internal to Ontario, but 50% of the value of it has to also be internal to Ontario, and they're being sued by um, in the World uh, Trade Organization um, court around that as we speak. Um, but Germany is is uh, one is a place that you, you might want to study because Germany has um, done it in a way that it paid a very high price for it initially. But then it has reduced the price since then. And now it's reducing the price by about 13% a year each January. Uh, and the price started, I believe, in the high 40s. It's now down to 29 cents as of, uh, as of January 1st. And, and, uh, and they can see the point where it crosses over the retail rate. Uh, and so they actually are perceiving a change in policy three or four years from now because of the enormous success. This is in terms of PV, not wind, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of solar cells, the enormous success uh, that's occurred. Um, and so, you know, they did 3,500 megawatts of, of PV last year, and they're going to do 5,000 this year. I think California has a total of 700, um, which is by, off the charts in terms of other states in the United States but you know, 5,000 in one year. Uh, and so they're getting to the point, because of the feed-in tariff, that, that they have literally not only built an industry, but redefined how they're approaching this. And we can talk in a lot more detail, but I think that that's fascinating. Whereas France and, 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 uh, and Spain and their feed-in tariffs have not. Um, that's been a, a different dynamic. So it gets very tricky about feed-in tariffs. By the way, one other thing, having written several books on on the, the history of electricity, we had for electricity regulation for 100 years that we would guarantee utilities mm -hmm. sufficient profit that they could invest, attract investment to build power plants. That's how it worked. And then we blew up that system and we deregulated wholesale and we deregulated retail and we put it into the. Well, feed and tariff goes back to that. It says we will guarantee a certain price in order to get investors to invest in this. And if we get too many people who want to invest, we're going to lower the price and continue to lower the price. But unlike the old days where the power plant was nuclear or coal or whatever, this is only going to be for renewables. And not only that, but we're going to give a higher premium for rooftop than we are for large centralized systems you know, and the like. So it, it literally goes back to the way we used to regulate utilities, except that now it's, it's a much more democratic um, regulation, if you will, and it's centered on a environmental um, you know, objective. One of our, our member cities is Gainesville, and one of the board members, Peggy Hanahan, who's mm -hmm. the past mayor, they've got a marvelous feed and test system that's working very well. Uh, they are innovative, uh, they do what it is you want to do with the utility, uh, and, uh, and they're very difficult to implement. Have you ever been the PACE program? Pardon? Is that a better way to get rooftop solar installed and all the it's an, it's, I'd say it's just another way. another way. Well, what the PACE program does is it, it allows the uh, it allows you to get financing over a long term right. Right. low interest rate. Regardless, the reason, bank, regardless, regardless of exactly. Bank, 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 bank. The reason that you would put solar on your roof is because of all the incentives that the federal and the state government do for it. Right. What a feed in tariff does, at least in Europe, okay. is it eliminates all those others. You don't get those incentives. Right. You don't get net metering, you don't get any other tax breaks or anything like that. All you get is the price. Over. But which in some ways, you know, it's very American. It's entrepreneurial. It right. says, hey, so the here's high the price. price. Now you know that. So let's go out and figure out how to get those panels up at the cheapest cost on my rooftop so I can start being an entrepreneur and making money and selling electricity to the grid. I mean, that's, 
in some ways that really, I think, should appeal to the American spirit of entrepreneurialism. And the other thing that it does is that if you have a tax incentive, it obviously is um, most beneficial to people who have a high tax liability and a high tax bracket. And for people who don't have any tax liability, it's worthless. Whereas if you have a feed-in tariff, you're essentially making your money not by offsetting your taxes, but by the revenue you get from selling your electricity. So suddenly it opens up ownership on a much wider scale. So. Yeah, the, the, the German uh, feed-in tariff system works without any taxes. So it is distributed uh, to the consumers and they pay the share, which is um, kind of a, a hamburger price, three, four dollars. And this created a, a, an interesting dynamic. And to the solar, um, it has been overvalued. And the solar industry made a lot of profit of that. This has something to do with this uh, Germany is not a very sunny place, it's like Alaska. But what, what we wanted to do is to create a, a market for that. And therefore, it's okay that now the government lowers the price. But what is interesting is that we have been creating 300,000 jobs in this sector. So, mm -hmm. German renewable industry is much more important than the classical fuel based industry. So, mm -hmm. it's an economic factor. Mm -hmm. And throughout the bench of the parties, there is nobody going against this anymore. And we have now in the electricity part, part we have 16% electricity contract for renewables. Sometimes we get 100% in, in peak times. Mm -hmm. This is because of feed-in tariff uh, privileges, renewables, uh, uh, vice versa, uh, the other ones. <coughs> and so sometimes nuclear power or the coal industry has to pay to feed in. So this is a situation where um, we hope that in 2050 we get all the electricity by, by renewables and, um, and by in a 10 years time, it's most likely that um, it's compatible. So that there is no any uh, stable or, or tax kind of incentive necessary that's a competitive industry. But we don't have gas, we don't have oil, we have all these interests on, 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 the, on the other side. And so this is what I see here, a very big factor. I mean, we pay meanwhile eight dollars per gallon, um, which is mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. so, we uh, one one so we more, one more, is, is, more is, one is more comment. Is it a federal comment, tariff uh, or is it established by um, each? What is it a canon? It's a federal tariff, and it, but it's uh, uh, differentiated uh, according to um, uh, the location where the windmill, for example, stands, or it's differentiated uh, according to the source, whether you feed in uh, wind energy, uh, bio uh, 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 gas, or, or solar. So if you can direct and promote all, all of these mm -hmm. and support the regions, the price structure, mm -hmm. etc., to keep them running. And so we have to get lots of lobby for that. Mm -hmm. uh, here the critical area is the farmers, because they introduce uh, uh, windmills on their farmland and got an extra venue, which is here very difficult because they are most farms are against them. So um, we bought them in, in, in the system and that uh, just broke a lot of resistance. Uh, well, I appreciate the, 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 the colloquy. Mm -hmm. That occurred in the conversation. And we will break now. I guess there's another session in a, in a little while. But thank you so much for attending.